one and go ahead. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Craig Hamilton, and I'll be your moderator for this panel today entitled Data Pedagogy and the Music Industries Challenges and Opportunities. Um, in my role as a research fellow at Birmingham City University, also, like many of you, I'm sure, a lifelong music fan who now has millions of songs available to me um, on a pocket device, something that would have been um, would have seemed like science fiction back in the early 1990s when I first started working um, in a record shop. Um, as we know, however, the consequences of these developments are not entirely benign. The new business models and practices um, of these services, our response to them as consumers, as artists, as labels, as educators, raise important questions around sustainability, accountability, fairness, privacy, truth, and a host of other very, very big questions. Um, I think we would all agree that the critical and practical skills of researchers, educators, and students in the humanities are now more than ever vitally important in helping to us to understand and navigate our new reality. I was also really interested in moderating this panel today because my research takes a practice-led approach that involves skills associated with data science and the digital humanities. Uh, this has involved working with large data sets, learning to code, building interactive um, interfaces, all as a means of trying to get to grips with by Google, Twitter, and all the others have contributed to the seismic shifts that we've seen in how we make, sell, market, listen to, and make meaning from popular music. In my teaching roles, I've also attempted to transfer some of those skills to my students in order to help them prepare for jobs and opportunities and in an increasingly data-led music industries, which is what brings us together as a panel today, which I hope uh, will help us get to grips with some of the things I've discussed in that introduction. And as with the wider summit, this panel is sponsored by Music ID. Uh, music ID is a leading academic platform and aggregator of global music chart data incorporating over 5,000 different charts, spanning 74 countries and over half a billion lines of data. Music ID provides unique access to contemporary and historical source music industry data related to physical purchase, digital downloads, and even Spotify streaming. Spanning over 120 years of records, the Music ID platform enables researchers and students to visualize, explore, compare, and download the data patterns and infographics for sales, revenue, and cultural impact for artists, albums, and singles across the world. Our panel today um, consists of uh, three people currently. We're waiting on one more. Hopefully, he'll be, he'll be here shortly. And in a moment, I'm going to get them to introduce themselves properly to you and to explain their current roles and areas of interest in relation to music, data, and pedagogy. But briefly, um, before I hand over and ask that question, I'd like uh, I'd ask you to welcome um, Dr. Joanna Love, uh, Associate Professor, Professor of Music at the School of Arts and Sciences at the University of Richmond. Um, her research interests include 20th and 21st century music with specializations um, in American popular music and music's role in advertising, film, film and video. Um, then we have um, Dr. Edward Ariaga, Associate Professor of Spanish, Global Languages and Cross-Cultural Studies at the University of Indianapolis. His areas of expertise include Latin American literature and cultural production, Afro-Latin American and Afro-Latina Latino cultures and cultural production, Spanish language and literature, the digital humanities and ethnic and migration studies. And finally, last but not least, we have Dr. Matt Flynn, a lecturer in music industry at the University of Liverpool in the UK, with an interest in how independent musicians and practice practitioners navigate the contemporary landscape of popular music. Prior to taking this role, Matt taught music business at the Liverpool Institute of Performing Arts, LIPA, and before moving into higher education, 
He was a self-employed practitioner in the music industries, owning rehearsal studios and an independent record label. So welcome um, to you all. Thank you for joining. We have around about 50 minutes for this session. And, um, and like you and everybody watching, I'm sure, I'm really looking, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, before we start properly, just some brief notes on the format. Um, I'm going to put a number of questions to the panel and hopefully we'll have a, a useful discussion. But I'm going to try and leave some time at the end um, for questions from the floor. Um, I believe you can raise your hand using the emoji function or you can type the question into the, the chat. Um, I'll do my very best to get around everybody in the time that we have. Um, but please do keep your questions or comments as brief as possible. So if I may, I'm now going to turn to our panelists. And Joanna, if I may start with you um, and each of you in turn, if, if I could ask you briefly just to introduce yourselves and, and just to say a little bit about your current uh, role and interest in music, data and education. So Joanna. Hi, thank you uh, for having me. And I think you sum you summarized my um, position well. So I'm a musicologist. Um, and so most of what I look at is um, obviously music history, but I do teach um, some kind of music industry oriented courses that are specifically about that. Um, I actually come from UCLA where I did teach in the music industry program when it was in its infancy and now it's huge now. Um, so a lot of what um, I teach at a small liberal arts university, you know, and so our degrees are a little bit different than some of the, the larger research institutions. But the way that I uh, use data or I have my students uh, use data is thinking about bigger questions. Right. And how do you get to um, the core of that through, you know, chart data or um looking at those world events that's, you know, connected to the chart data. So um, I, I write a lot myself. Um, my, most of my research is on music and advertising, either on um, political or national brand advertising, um, although I'm starting to move into some other realms. But um, we know in the U.S. Um, the um, music has been popular um, through advertising as they were always emulating the music industry. And so um, using uh, chart data, um, going through, um, for instance, you know, looking at uh, 1971's Hilltop by Coca-Cola, right? Um, I like to teach the world to sing as, as a becomes a, a chart topping single, but it does that um, not only by remaking itself, but um, by um, sounding like uh, the counterculture, which had just um, happened and kind of fizzled out, right? So 1971. And so it sounds like um, I was able to go through the chart data and see that, you know, it sounds like Bridge Over Troubled Water and it sounds like um, Carol King's Tapestry. And, and those are the reasons why it gets the success it does. And so, um, like I said, the, the way that I use data is more kind of a from a historical standpoint and looking at trends, um, comparing it with what um, I encourage my students to go in and compare, you know, what are the sounds at the moment? Uh, is, does this stand out? Why does it stand out? Um, and really, you know, using those musicological skills to dig into the whys and the hows. Um, so the data is, is, of course, a jumping off point. And then, of course, my students also intern in the music industry. And so they're using, um, you know, they're teaching me all the time the things that, you know, universal music or you know, some of the smaller labels, the ways that they're using data to uh, to figure out, um, you know, maybe what Jimmy Fallon is going to use on his show or, or things like that. Um, and so there, there's a, you know, big data is everywhere. It's not just music. And we've had this kind of unique um, situation where we've relied on charts, right, since the early 20th century. And so um, it's kind of ingrained in what we do. Thank you. Edward, if I could go to you next, please. Yes, uh, thank you for having me as well. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, my name, as, as you uh, introduced me, is Eduardo Arriaga, I'm uh, Associate Professor and Chair in the Department of Global Languages. And my, my research is uh, mostly connected to the digital humanities and, and looking at how uh, particularly, and, and this is a kind of a concept that I've been working with uh, for the past uh, five or seven years, which is kind of a, community digital humanities and looking at how um, different communities are adopting a, a, and adapting uh, digital tools to create their own um, uh, cultural productions and, and their own, own voices. Um, in, in terms of music, I've been, I've been um, working um, since uh, last two years in, in a project uh, and I, I got the Music ID uh, Fellowship 
to do that. And I've been uh, researching about uh, how um, a rhythm and, and a genre uh, like reggaeton became so uh, washed out, you know, so white in terms of, of uh, when it became a, a mainstream, it, it started as, as it started as a, as a black rhythm, but when it became mainstream, uh, sort of uh, a, a way for, for it to be accepted is uh, to become more and more white, no? So uh, what I do is, is uh, trying to, to uh, search for paths, for, for patterns and, and trying to understand through charts how that can be uh, uh, visualized, seen, uh, understood from, from the data perspective, no? Um, and in, pedag in pedagogy, I also use data to uh, spark interest for my students to actually start asking questions, no? I start asking uh, those uh, difficult questions that sometimes you don't, you don't ask when you don't see the, the trend or you don't see um, the, the pattern uh, visualized in a chart, no? Um, so that's basically what I've been doing. And, and, and I think... Uh, my students appreciate uh, the use of technology sometimes, but also struggle. <laughs> uh, and I think I, I know this is this is part of the conversation here. Uh, and I will go into more detail uh, later on. But I, I, I would say that that's part of, of the of the um, positive aspect of using data in uh, pedagogy as well. Thank you. Yeah. And finally, uh, Matt, if I could ask you to respond to the same question. Yeah, again, thanks for having me on the panel. Um, so my sort of engagement with music and data has been slightly very practical initially, um, trying to educate aspiring musicians and helping inform them of all the ways in which they have to produce data, um, manage data, um, submit data, um, into Things, very pra practical applications and the, and the increasing importance of that uh, and how um, good data management has particular uh, value to it and the, the, the data that they provide has value um, and those types of things. And then over time, it's as, as we sort of moved into a more, um, when I was first doing this, you, you still signed up for the, the PRS Collection Society in the UK with a paper form and submitted the data on paper forms and those types of things. Um, obviously, as things have digitized over the last 25 years, there's been much more um, demand and increased demand on, on supplying data and management data, managing data. So teaching musicians to understand what that data is, um, how it's used, how it's relevant to them. Uh, and then increasingly, as we start to get um, as Edward's just been alluding to insight panels um, on, uh, on their digital distributors, their aggregators, how to make sense of those things um, and use them in a productive way. My, my key area of interest is in um, music makers decision making. And so they've got all this floods of data around them and available to them, but actually how to use it in a way that's productive, that helps them make more informed career choices and career decisions as they try and move forward with the careers is really uh, the thing that I've been wrestling with for a, a couple of years and trying to gradually embed more of that into the into the curriculums that are delivered, which are now predominantly orientated towards master students um, with focus on careers in the music industries. So not just uh, musicians, but music in potential well, aspiring music industry practitioners who will have gone to all all areas of the industry. Thank you. Uh, some great responses. Thank you. And I, I, in a in a in a question or two's time, I'd like to pick up a little bit more on what Joanna and Edward have said about using the data to look at historical um, uh, elements of teaching. But if I could just pick up on Matt's, uh, some of the things Matt said there around uh, data management, uh, understanding insight panels. I'd like to, first of all, discuss the, the extent of the role of data in the, in the contemporary music industries, first of all. So some figures to provide context there. I'm sure you're aware of things like this, but uh, there were 872.6 billion audio streams served in the US alone last year. Um, streaming accounts for 61.2% of record label revenues, according to the IFPI. That's grow, grown by 20% year on year uh, or on last year. Um, each of those data points represents um, not just uh, a sale or a stream, but also a wealth of information about consumers, the value chain. 
Meanwhile, Spotify has just opened up in 85 new markets, uh, bringing their total of countries to 178. So that volume and variety and velocity of data is going to increase further. So to pick up on Matt's point, and maybe if I could, if I could go to Matt first on this one, how do we, if before we can teach people this stuff, how do we even begin to make sense of this stuff? Is is my question. Um, <laughs> difficult because obviously most of the data is pro- that we're talking about is proprietary, and so uh, it's very difficult to to um, find companies who are willing to do um, research projects um, and and make available data available to academics and researchers and those types of things. There were a couple of early on um, in Scandinavia before Tidal became Tidal. I can't remember what it was originally called. There was some research done around that. Um, but yeah, so that's one of the biggest issues really. And when you go to any sort of presentations by um, Spotify, you know, there's a certain um, limit on what they will disclose. Understandably, it, it's, it's what gives them their competitive advantage. Um, so that's that's what that's one of the first challenges. You actually don't get to see the data or how it's being used or, or manipulated. Then is getting students to understand that that's what goes on. So even just the basic understanding of you, you discover weekly is your discover weekly because of the, the understanding that Spotify has of you as a consumer. And certainly undergraduate students are, are completely ignorant to to that reality. Really, a, a lot of the time, are very shocked to discover that that's what's going on beh- behind the scenes. Um, and how their the taste to being um, shaped, I think, is maybe a, a nice way of saying it, um, um, by by these companies. Um, um, and 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 in in some ways, you know, the aim is to give you know give you more of what you we think you want, um, and, and it seems to be working as a business model, certainly. Um, so yeah, just the, the fundamental structures. Then then you obviously, from a business point of view, you've got the economics behind that and. Um, Big debates in the UK currently about the you know the fairness of of, of payment through to songwriters and artists um, and how it works on a, a sort of a market share model of the collective you know use of the catalogue and your percentage share within that. So all of, even just those basic concepts are quite difficult to translate to to young aspiring musicians. You know, eighteen to twenty five who are still learning the fundamentals of the industry. Yeah, so they're, they're just they're just the headline challenges. Just even explaining how Spotify works is it is difficult. And again, with only using sort of the information that Spotify will give you, or or blogs like Music Machinery or things like that, that give you a little bit of in, into insight into basically every interaction that um, people engage in, consumers engage in on Spotify, um, pro- pro- provides data. Um, to Spotify, and then obviously you've got the input end as well from a production point of view, um, teaching musicians that they have to use aggregators that distribute into Spotify, how they use their artist panel um, to help help them. Again, that's the other challenge that the artist insight panel is all very well and good and provides some great data on their particular project. The problem is, as we all know with big data, it's the insight that you can gain by measuring lots of data about lots of different things. That one insight panel to that artist, okay, gen- generally shows the metrics going up because they seem to just go up anyway. Um, more users, more use. Um, but but really, it doesn't really provide much else in, in way of, you know, other than maybe where they're popular or those things. So it gives, it's, it's added some um, additional benefit um, to musicians planning tours when they could uh, and those types of things. But it's not really, in, in, it's incomparable really to what Spotify can understand about its producers and its consumers. Uh, it's a very um, unbalanced landscape, I would say. Thanks, Matt. And going to you, to sort of pick up on that, Edward, because you mentioned the, um, the, the research into uh, reggaeton that you're, you and your students, was it just you or your students? I can't quite recall, but how, how did you find um, navigating the sort of complexity and some of the issues that Matt talks about in terms of access and incomplete data when you were, trying to perform that kind of research and, and teaching? Well, I, I kind of felt really identified with what Matt just said, because uh, actually when we, I, I was doing the research or yeah, right now that I'm, that I'm currently uh, completing the research, uh, you realize that if you're looking at the um, emergence of the genre, you kind of are in a you know uh, dark uh, waters because you don't. There is no information for for a genre 
that was uh, um, labeled as underground um, for starters. No, and when you find something, uh, you don't find charts for uh, for the for the date the the songs were produced, but you 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 find charts and you find data like like retroactive data, kind of uh, uh, if if you have a, a song that was uh, um, uh, produced in the nineties, but this artist uh, uh, got several hits after that then that uh, element it's uh, um, considered within the charts, you know, uh, that at first wasn't considered because it wasn't part of the industry, no? So we're talking about here uh, how the industry has a sort of gatekeepers uh, based on data uh, and how um, those gatekeepers are kind of uh, getting all the information, trying to... Uh, uh, develop a sort of uh, of uh, huge databases that sometimes uh, are hidden from from uh, the consumer's perspective and are hidden from um, the the producer's perspective as well. You know, so it's kind of uh, that this black box in which you don't know what's go what's what's happening. So that's my experience so far with um, with searching and researching about these. Uh, initial uh, steps, initial stages of uh, reggaeton and looking at how it, it became so global that now you can find uh, information all over the place, you know? So, yeah. And is it the same with you, Ujana, with, with trends, looking at trends? Is it, is it do, you, do you find that you reach a, an impasse of sorts in terms of not being able to get at perhaps some of the detail that you wanted or, or, or is that easier with historical data or easier now than it, than it would have been well anything before the 20th or the 21st century right anything before streaming is going to be difficult and even you know we know that the the billboard charts have been manipulated for all of the 20th century right until we get the barcode is really when when people are a little bit more truthful and as edward is finding right all of this is whitewashed and it's about marketing right and so if it didn't fit into um you know those labels are based on things like tempo and instrumentation and things like that right and so um you know, uh, I, you know, one question I start with my students is, have you ever been listening to Spotify and they recommend something that they think you'll like and you think, what? Right. And that's because of the way it's labeled, right? It's labeled for marketing purposes. But as, as Edward points out, points out that like, you know, reggaeton, all, all of those, those influences could have been in there, but it wasn't necessarily thought of as that, right? Or if it's underground, that's why you still have physical archives, you need to go into those archives and look at the zines that were created, right? Or the old concert, like look at early hip hop, right? You still, you still have to go look at the mixtapes and things like that. That's not going to be in in the ID, right? The music ID. So um, it's, our, it, it gets, it gets really tricky, right? And so I think one of those challenges of um, especially music data is, and that's why it's important, all of these kind of NEA, uh, NEH grants, right? To digitize archives because um, the stuff like, um, I, again, I keep gravitating towards Edward because because I understand that that um, that conundrum there is you have to have the, the physical data in there um, because uh, the, there are things that the church just don't capture and it's not accurate. Right. Like we we know that there were we know there were bots. Right. That were that were hitting Spotify streams. Right. We know that there's payola going on in the in the 1950s. Right. We know all of this stuff is happening. And so that's where the humanities come in. Right. Is is the interpretation parts. And um, I've had lots of students work for the music industry and do things like publishing companies where their job was to tag like all of the fish albums. Right. <laughs> and there's a lot of those. But, um, you know, if, if my um, brilliant pianist um, student uh, mislabels something or she hears, a t you know, she hears it a little bit different, then that's always how it's going to be coded. And so there's challenges, right? It's not scientific and it's actually a story of humans. <laughs> so, yeah. So, which is, thank you. And that's a, an excellent point in terms of our relationship with data. I think it's not a, all, that all of you have raised. It's, um, it's perhaps not... When people see data, they perhaps think that it's something that you need to be able to code to understand. But actually, you also need to understand the structures that uh, that have created that data and the reasons they created it, which is, as you say, Joanna, where the, the humanities comes in. So if I could move you now towards um, the pedagogy side of things, if, if I could, and given the complexity and speed of development in the current landscape and, and some of the issues that you raised, 
Um, how do you, as educators, approach the challenge, challenge of preparing students as they work towards gaining the skills and knowledge required uh, to operate effectively as they move into roles? And that could be some of the things you mentioned, Joanna. They could be digitizing archives. They could be versal as a data entry clerk in publishing or what, what have you. Or Matt, you know, one of your guys uh, who's operating their own record label. How, how do you um, approach um, teaching those guys to be ready when they leave your institutions? Joe, and I'll, I'll, since you had the baton, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it with you and then we'll move on from you if that's okay. Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, it's tricky. Um, again, for um, at least, again, I see a lot of students that it's a liberal arts institution. I also have, I have music majors, but I also have a lot of students who do interdisciplinary, like American studies and gender studies and things like that. And so honestly, for the, for students who are really interested in music industry focused careers, at least here in the US, like an internship is indispensable, right? There are the skills that I give the, you know, I can give them, but my, our curriculum is stacked. You know, there's, the, there's no more room. And, and I think that if I had, I know that if I had students that were really interested in the, in, you know, the data and the science of it, I would tell them to go take a sociology of stats class, go take a stats class in the business school, um, go take, if you're good with computers, go take a coding class, right? So actually, I'm not saying that our, our department can't do it, but we don't have room in our curriculum to squeeze anything more in, right? And so I try to do a unit on it, right? And in some of my industry courses, but, you know, that's not enough to get them to do the crazy things Matt was talking about, right, in terms of understanding Spotify. We talk about it for an hour and then we move on. So, yeah. Matt, how about you? I mean, teaching the guys from a more business angle, is, is it what are some of the challenges you come up against? Well, yeah, it, as Joanna's just alluded to, having space in the curriculum to accommodate in the curriculum that's already full and trying to so I would like to move to a point where we have a dedicated module that deals with it and brings in specialists um, from sociology and, and there's some basic coding and those types of things. But And I've started the journey towards that, I think. But actually, um, universities move, move at glacial pace, <laughs> especially, com <laughs> especially compared to the industry, which, move, which you know is evolving rapidly. And so trying to play, you're always trying to play catch up, I think, um, from an education point of view. Um, I've used Music ID uh, more productively in the last couple of years to try and, um, you know, look at questions about, you know, is the album really dead and those types of things from the questions that I pose to students. So that gets them to engage with big data sets in a way that's informative and insightful to them. And so that's the thing that I've started to try and embed um, in some of the modules, particularly the actual and copyright modules and, and those types of things where there's a, of data um and that's slow um one of the problems is me <laughs> um i need to learn i was never I've, I've never been educated to to manage or, or what you know work data so i understand from an having a, previously had an independent record label what a, a record label, label needs to do to register its, its rights with with um the sort of pros and and the information that distributors require so i can teach that and it's very practical really in lots of ways once you understand it you know know what it is but but then more sort of the, those bigger conceptual things you know value in publishing catalogs is Joanna's just been been talking about and looking at logs of value, particularly with the with the big exchanges of money that we've seen for publishing catalogs in the in the last twelve months. So there's lots of great in, interesting questions around. Okay, well, how are publishers value and why is Bob Dylan's song catalog worth three hundred million dollars? Um, and we can use platforms like Music ID to explore those issues. It's just having the space and me knowledge in college and the technical knowledge to be able to deliver that in a way that you're confident that the students are getting a good learning experience. And again, so there's that, you know, there's an element of teaching the teachers first and foremost to be able to, to use the tools that, that, that we can then sort of uh, instruct the students in, in a confident and, and competent way. So they're, they're the, for me at the minute, they're the fundamental challenges. There's a willingness there, the time to actually learn it myself and then the time to um, embed it into the existing curriculum are the things that, that are most challenging and it's just it's just taking it very very slowly and um, I'll, I'll just get to uh, the fundamentals of of um you know the basic working in fiat economy and blockchain will be here and we'll have to rethink everything again <laughs> <laughs> edward do you have anything to add i mean we it, i think those are excellent points around the 
the space in the curriculum uh, and the skills of us as researchers as well. You know, like, I don't know, like Matt says, you know, like when people talk to, I'm reasonably tech savvy, but when people explain blockchain to me, there's just this whooshing sound as things fly over my head. But the, what, what are some of the other challenges that you, that you, uh, that you, yeah, I think I would, I would point out to two of, uh, of the biggest challenges. One is, uh, uh, and, and I think that builds up on, on, on Matt's uh, comment, which is a lack of communication between industry and academy. You know, we kind of uh, become two worlds, uh, separated worlds. And, uh, and sometimes when you're trying to teach students uh, uh, some kind of uh, data skills uh, or, or skills to, to work with data that is used in the, in the, in the, um, in the industry, you kind of, you know, get hold back by, by the tradition of the university, which is going through uh, a different set of skills or set of knowledges, a uh, set of knowledge or, or, or uh, information that um, needs to be discussed first before going into uh, uh, actually working with data or developing those skills. And the other part is when, when you're stuck in those uh, um, uh, issues, uh, the, the solution would be collaboration, but that's uh, another uh, issue we face in, in, in academia sometimes is a lack of collaboration between, between experts or between uh, colleagues. Uh, Joanna were, was mentioning how she's not able to squeeze everything in, in their curriculum. And I, I think we all face the same uh, issue. But uh, also, we, we need to uh, invite people to, okay, this is a, 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 a problem and a research problem that uh, probably deserves your attention and it would be a good, good idea to collaborate and, and use your skill set, my skill set, the other person's skill set, and create a sort of, a, of a, a symbiosis there in which uh, we actually create answers for, for these, quest these questions. Yeah, and in the UK, I mean, I'm sure it's, you have a similar system in the States, but Matt will tell you as well that a lot of universities are trying to kind of get these things off the ground through things that they're calling um, incubation clusters is one of the buzzwords that you hear and knowledge exchange. But I think you're right, Edouard, that, that often, and, as, and Matt alluded to, the, the different paces that business and academia work at often mean that um, these projects are very difficult to get off the ground um, and then, as you also alluded to, Edward, there's, the, 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 there's a rigorous ethics process that you need to go through when you're doing research at a university. Um, and if you're a tech bro, you probably can't even spell ethics, right? So it, the, there's a different, there's, there are different levels of operation uh, in terms of working on these projects. So based on that, I wonder whether, and I'll go, I'll go back to you, Edward, first, because I think it picks up on your maid. Um, if you could put one thing in place that's currently missing from education provision as it relates to data literacy or skills, um, what would it be? I'm putting you on the spot first. My apologies for coming to you first. Uh, the other two get a couple of minutes to think about their answer. But if there was, if there was one thing or one kind of um, initiative that you could get off the ground, what would it be? No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think... Um that something that is lacking in this uh, process is actually making students aware of uh, how data works. You know, because uh, we talk about, oh, we're teaching these uh, digital natives and uh, they know everything about uh, digital technology and so on and so forth. But you, you realize that they lack all, all of these skills when you, you start talking about uh, data and technology with them you know uh like uh, two weeks ago we were we were uh talking about a chart and they they said i, I don't know how to read a chart for starts you know so that's one important piece that we're lacking at, at the university level at, at, at in academia sometimes we continue, I, and I understand that, that these basic skills of reading, uh, writing are important, are, are the base for all of the other skills, but we need to start uh, working on, on the development of these new skill sets uh, that, that um, industry and the society are relying on uh, all the time. 
So basically just an understanding that when you pick up your phone, you are creating data points and what those data points look, look like. I think Matt mentioned that earlier that students being appalled when they know how Spotify uh, gathers data about them. And in fact, one of the, in a copyright class I used to teach, I used to show everybody the terms and conditions from Facebook after I'd explained copyright to them. And I would ask them if they would ever sign a contract like this. And they, they would all say no. And then I would ask them if they had a Facebook account. And, you know, um, so, yeah, there, there, there are things like that that we can perhaps do, um, uh, bring through. But I think you're absolutely right. Those sort of basic building blocks of literacy are, 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 are key. Matt, uh, uh, Edward's already picked a, uh, the, the key, uh, one of the key ones, but is there anything else that you, you would love to see put in place if you could? If you could wave, wave a magic wand and remove the issues around them, uh, clogging and, and, and all the issues that we talked about earlier, I think that you would like to parachute in if possible. I think for me it's about consistency of approach. I think the, this is one of the things that is – um, even things like, you know, the platforms that we use currently use to, to manipulate data platforms like Music ID, if you don't use them with any regularity, you have to relearn the skill all the time. And you constantly go back. If you're registering, registering your rights on, on the PRS database, which is, you know, the UK's very my, if you don't use those things regularly, you have to go back and reteach yourself the skill all the time. So there's something about being consistent over time and embedding those sort of fundamental skills throughout a curriculum over a period of time. So they become huh, much more, nat I wouldn't say second nature, but much more natural and intuitive in, in, in doing them. Uh, then they couldn't, but well, it seems to be you, you, you are reinventing the wheel metaphorically all the time when you go, when you start to use new platforms and new data sets, it seems that you have to relearn, relearn the skill to do it first before you can actually get into the bit that you really want to, interested in which is what does this data tell us and and how does it affect me or or this particular subject so a, a, a consistency of approach would be the thing i would aspire aspire to i think as someone who has learned coding one finger at a time and who has to constantly go back to stack overflow to learn how to do the simplest of things that's absolutely true i believe um that kind of keeping those uh, those um skills fresh mm. uh, is really key and joanna is the is the one from from you perhaps um yeah i mean i i would echo all of those like one of the the things is you know um and and this is just this is 18 year olds that i work with but also just being in a fast-paced work world it is still it's very similar to archival work where you have to be patient and you have to be willing to spend the time to do it like matt was saying like you know one thing i say to them is you know, this is a really powerful tool or whatever it is. It's a powerful tool, but you actually have to spend time to do it. It is not like Google and it's not going to come up with a bunch of things. Right. And and then you have to learn how to interpret it. And it's those are these are skills. These are life skills. Right. And um, as as was alluded to earlier, you know, um, we, at least me, I'll speak for myself, um, I didn't learn these skills going even through my PhD program, right? Because there were all of these other skills I had to learn. And um, I, one thing that's that's improving, at least at my institution, um, I've been on some of the general education, I have said to us data literacy, like writ large, right? Data literacy is something that students in the 21st century need. And so that is something we are improving. And I think that that will help us right um so it's not all in-house that we're teaching them this um but yeah and then um i would say again collaboration like if i could wave the wand like what matt was saying that is the and edward said this too you know academia moves at a glacial pace you know i mean um, I was thinking through um, my advertising book, you know, I started that really in 2010 and it came out in 2019 because of the process of peer, well, not only peer review, but research, right? And so, and then by the time I do that, the advertising industry is like so far <laughs> past where I started, which is why it's good to work on history, right? Then you don't have to apologize, <laughs> but, um, but, but it moves so fast. And again, I think for me, internships are key at my small liberal arts university. I need them to go into the field and just be thrown into the deep end in a way that I can't, you know, I can't do for them. And I think you mentioned that right at the top as well, Joanna, how you're learning from your students, you know, you're, you're picking things up from them when they come back from their internships. And I think, I think it's also really interesting as well, how uh, all three of you, are using this music ID platform 
um, in within the restraints of your uh, of your current modules to try and teach some of those skills to look back on the Coca Cola advert or the the emergence of a, a genre as far as you can, um, given given the constraints of data. I I want to leave a couple of minutes for questions from the floor. I believe we have until. Um, well, it's 10 to 4 in the afternoon here in the UK, but it's 10 to 11, it's 20 to 11 where right, you are, right? So I believe we have until um, until 10.50 a.m., if that's if, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm going to throw one final question at the panel, if that's okay, and then I'll open, I'll open things to the floor. Um, the, the really quick one. Thinking of your current and your future students, um, what would be one piece of advice around practical data skills or literacy that you would like to see them take on board? Just, just one, the, be the most important one. Uh, Matt, looks like he, he has an answer. Know the value of it and manage it effectively. Thank really. you. Yeah. yeah. Edward? I think um, one valuable advice would be um, be critical about data. Don't take it as face value. Okay, thank you. Joanna? Same, yes, be critical and know, learn how to ask the right questions. Okay, so value it, but also understand that it's worthless and understand why it's worthless and valuable at the same time um, and know how it all fits together. I mean, I think that... That's pretty much how you become a data scientist. Um, uh, it, the combination of your your three answers there. Um, I'm, I'd like to throw. Um, I, I, I'm not don't have visibility on on the audience, but I there is one question so far that I will put. Um, we've kind of answered this already, but maybe maybe a little bit more detail on this. It's from from Armin. Um, do do the panel engage students in the Music ID software? And do they learn about the software um, in class? So I, I guess, do you teach the rudiments of, uh, of using Music ID? And I guess, do you first have to learn that before you then teach it, I guess. Is, so whichever of you want to take that one. I'll say yes, because we do every single one of my classes, believe it or not, student, I teach a lot of GE courses. So I say there is a, a music library and there's music resources. And so we actually have an entire music resource day. And depending on the course, um, I'll spend more or less time on, on music ID, but I do introduce it at the beginning. Well, in the early stages of all of my classes. Okay. I know Matt, you're just getting on board with music ID, but do you give them a quick tour or? So previously, I've used it with dedicated students for like dissertation research and those types of things. And so sort of, we've done that collaboratively, collaboratively through the supervision. And Music ID very often provided support for those particular students, which has been really useful. Um, but now I'm just starting to embed it into a module. And so there'll be an introduction of this is how you use the platform. And then there'll be tasks based around getting them to go and use the platform and come up with answers and insights and, and those types of things. But I'm just in the beginning phase of doing that. We haven't actually done the, the This Is Music ID class yet. That's at the end of this month. But yeah, it, it's been a slow, again, a slow evolution towards towards this stage. But once I've done, I've done it once and delivered it once and uh, taught it and again with support from the Music ID team. I think it will um, it'll be something that become much more embedded, consistently using it as I was as I was talking about. And like Joanna says, when you watch a you teach the students the basics, but then they'll probably outstrip you within a couple of weeks, and you'll be learning from them. How, how, you know, what a couple could. of minutes in my case, I think. Edward, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, is it the same with you? Anything to add to that one before I move on to the next question? Yeah, I actually let them uh, play with the tool, uh, allow them to get frustrated. And then from that frustration, we can actually ex make more experiments and learn new things. Yeah, exactly how you learn new technologies. You try and break it and you, it, let it try and break you. And, and then you learn something. Um, there's, a, there's a slightly bigger uh, question from the audience uh, and again, we, we, we're running short on time, so as quickly as you can. Uh, oh, hang on, they're flowing through quick. I, I'm, I'm not adept at reading these questions. Um, let's have a look. Um, do any of the panel have any ideas how academia can try to stay on pace with the music industry? 
Um, for me, that's just more collaborations with 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 businesses and business more. You know, direct partnerships, internships, year in industries with students. Students are a good way of building those relationships, as Joanna's alluded to. They're into, you know, you you build that relationship by providing students to businesses and then you build relationships with the businesses um and certainly that's one of the things that university Liverpool will be trying to do on a very regional level in 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 particular um for me that's one of the ways that you 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 try and keep a pace okay eduardo or joanna yeah i think i think uh collaboration with uh industry is the best way to uh learn from them and uh have industry to to learn from uh, academia, because uh, it seems that that uh, if if we if we look back at, at, at our discussion, it would look like uh, we're criticizing academia all the time. But there are good things, you know, that are uh, worth implementing in the in the industry and do exchanges. Okay. Yeah, I try to have a, a panel of industry people. Like, I'll have a law, a entertainment lawyer, and a label exec, and you know, and then and bring them in a composer. You know, those sorts of things from the industry try to come into my classes. So I try to send students to them and bring them in. I'm also though in uh, Richmond, Virginia is not the music capital of the world, so it can get challenging. But that's what Zoom is for, right? So. <laughs> um, okay, we have one. Thank you, everyone. We have one time for one final question. Um, Uh, and this is actually, this is a very good question. I don't, it's not telling me who the questions come from. My apologies to anybody watching that I'm not um, giving the names of the people who are given these questions. But um, the question from the floor is, I'm curious if the panelists or anyone here has studies or data set examples um, you use in... I'm working with data. Now the person says I've made some up, but I'm wondering uh, if they didn't hear the question. I'm back again. Yeah, back again. We'll have to repeat the question, Craig, if you don't mind, please. My my, my apologies. Uh, the que the person is curious to know if panelists have any um, favourite case studies of data set examples that they use in class assignments. So perhaps something from Music ID or elsewhere that you use as a way to teach data in class. Um, I don't know if it's a favorite, but what, one thing I'll do with my students, I, I teach a, a popular music of the 70s and 80s course, you know, and um, uh, if I have students choose, I don't know, they'll choose like chic, right? Um, they'll chic good times, right? They'll, they'll choose that. I'll tell them to go look at the charts and tell me, you know, why is this popular, right? So is disco at its peak? Um, look at movies, look at the, you know, look at the world events, who's president, things like that. Um, and it'll give them good insights of does this fit into what everybody's listening to or are we watching the the cusp of the genre and then i'll have them back up like look at the the years prior and the years after and you know watch the charting data the other thing i have them really pay attention to is things like you know michael jackson died in 2009 thriller all of a sudden hit the charts again so like um may, I, maybe i won't tell them i'll say why is thriller on the charts right in 2009 and, and have them kind of dig through that okay thank you Any other favorite data sets from Matt or Edouard? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, mine, right, sorry. Mine, yeah. Uh, uh, this is the challenge that I'm faced with coming up with over the next few weeks because I'm going to start teaching it at a class level for the first time. So I'm going to um, take some of Joanna's ideas, if she doesn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, up to this point, it's been much more about particular research questions that students have devised for this station. So, yeah, the, uh, the example would be the most recent example would be the, you know, Is the album dead type of question and using music ID to, to look at sales data and and that type of thing and um and and the student found out that it wasn't as dead as everyone claims it to be so uh which was quite an interesting result uh, but th those types of things it's, it, those types of research questions i think uh, how i've approached it so far what yeah to close uh, to wrap it up i would say that uh uh One of my, my most important data sets is uh, uh, me, Latin music from, uh, from the 90s uh, uh, to the 20s, to the 2000s, uh, looking at how 
uh, for instance, the, the taste of, of, of music and consumption, consumption changed, uh, making uh, um, room for other genres and, 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 uh, and, you know, representations within the music industry as well. Thank you. I mean, I think all of those examples of, you know, it, they tick some of the boxes that we've been talking about, don't they? That, that you can use a data set not only to explore the question that you're looking at, but also it's almost kind of like Mr. Miyagi taught Daniel how to play uh, do karate by cleaning the, cleaning the, uh, the deck in. It's a similar sort of thing. You're learning data skills by stealth, by actually answering a cultural studies question, I suppose. Um, we are, I'm afraid, running uh, rapidly out of time. So um, I'm going to say thank you to Matt, Edward and Joanna for their fantastic contributions and their patience with my uh, somewhat erratic questioning at times. Um, and our apologies for dropping out also. Um, uh, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of Mir and Music ID, thank uh, all of you guys. Um, thanks also to those of you who provided questions and comments from the floor. Um, thanks to the music, uh, the, the panel um, tech team for, for keeping all this this running so smoothly um before uh we go i'd like to remind you about the is it is it mia or how do you say mia i've, I've been saying mia is that correct the mia meets session um uh in june hosted by music id uh which uh will be providing more uh detail on this panel topic uh, as well as a webinar demonstration event being held on the 26th of may at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time or 5 p.m. UK time. Um, and if you would like to sign up to these or learn more about the Music ID platform, uh, please click the Music ID logo at the top of your screen um, and you'll receive more details via email. But um, from a very overcast um, Birmingham here in the UK, I'm going to sign off now. Thank you, Matt, uh, Edward and Joanna uh, for your time today. I hope the rest of you have found this panel useful and that the sun is shining where you are. Um, and uh, let's continue this discussion uh, uh, over the coming years and see where we get to. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.